or welcome. The young people can be dismissed to junior worship. You know, today after church, we will have a fellowship meal to celebrate all the new members and attendees that have been coming to Cactus Christian Fellowship. It's sort of exciting to see the church grow and it also presents a lot of different ideas that I have as well to see what we're going to do in the future. So today I've, I've done a series of messages recently on, on the spiritual gifts, but today I'm going to just preach a sermon that I want to preach, <laughs> sort of for fun. Uh, if you have your, your Bibles open, turn to Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 and on. And I'll read those to you. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by a boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit on the, down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave, it, gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They ate, and they were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides the women and the children. Every time I read that story, it, it makes me understand the power and the strength of God and, and how I appreciate what God can do. You know, aside from the resurrection story, the feeding of 5,000 is the only other miracle recorded in the four Gospels. Obviously, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John considered this a significant miracle. From their own eyewitness testimony, we see how this miracle was when Christ fed the masses that day. He began with only five barley loaves and two fish. We're starting with more than that today to feed our group. So think about that for a second. You know, the, and they were borrowed from a boy's lunch. You know, here in John, it says, John 6, 9, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. But how far will that go among so many? You know, I promise you today that we're starting with more than that. So I really expect you to stay for the meal afterwards so that we can get to know each other a little bit better. You know, Jesus caught his disciples off guard. Would you think Jesus planned to feed 5,000 people with those five loaves and two fish? It would indeed take a miracle to do that. You know, in fact, in Matthew 14, 21, it says about 5,000 men were fed in addition to the women and children. Many of the Bible scholars believe that there were probably 15 to 20,000 people that day that partook of five loaves and two fish. It's no wonder that Jesus' disciples had wanted to send the crowds away when evening was approaching. You know, they were in a remote place and they knew the people needed to reach the surrounding villages to buy food or find lodging. You know, or, or they were likely to go hungry. It's no wonder that the disciples were uneasy about the whole idea. Feed so many was so little. That's a concept we have a hard time with. In our thinking today, we put a great deal of emphasis on more. You know, in our society, more is better. Gotta have more. But Jesus 
knew better, didn't he? Jesus had a better idea. He looked at his disciples and he said, you give them something to eat. At that point, the disciples should have recalled the many miracles they had seen up to this point. All those things sometimes become so much different when Jesus relies on us personally, doesn't it? To accomplish what others think is impossible. You know, I've come face to face with that a time or two, and I can say I've simply failed in my faith. You know, only to have Jesus take over and make a miracle happen. Even then, I have often faced the attitude in many that it can't be done. But I've seen it done time and time again. You know, I'm at the age and place in my life now where I know that it can happen. I've seen it. I know that miracles happen today. You know, I don't like to hear that we can't do this or we can't do that. You know, I must admit that I have less patience than I did when I was younger, and yet I should have more patience, shouldn't I, as I get older? But I claim a promise. In Luke 1.37 it says, For with God nothing will be impossible. Amen. Think about it for a minute. Whether it's 5,000, 15,000, or 20,000, how in the world were they going to accomplish feeding those people with five small barley loaves and two fish? Often we can't see what can be accomplished with the power of Christ because it seems just too big for us. We find limitations rather than blessings. We find it that it will cost too much rather than with it's, with it's within the reach of our belief in Jesus Christ. How many times have I heard, we can't afford it, we can't do this, or it is impossible? There are just too many times in which I have said that myself. I'll give you a perfect example. In my first church start, I was a young man, and I was hired by the New Mexico Christian Evangelistic Association to start a church in Las Cruces, New Mexico. You know, God began to bless that church. A local developer responded to a letter that I had sent to all kinds of developers within the city of Las Cruces, and he donated 10 acres of land to the new church. We were meeting in a storefront, and we soon outgrew the storefront. And another church in, in Cedar Crest, New Mexico, had a large modular building, and they asked us if we would take that for the church, and we did, moved in, but in no time at all, we began to outgrow that modular building. And someone said, we need to build a building. That sounded great, but the church board began to play, plan and decided to build a building that would seat 350 people. I said, we only have 100 now, and the cost is way out of line, 350? But the church board said, yep, that's what we're going to do. Well, I sort of thought like the apostles, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one of those 5,000 to even have a bite. That's what I thought. You know, but Andrew and Philip ask questions as we have it many times. Where's the money going to come from? Or Jesus, what are you thinking? It's impossible. I did the very same thing. A building for 350, I don't see it, guys. I don't see we can afford it. And let's get reasonable and let's start smaller. But Gary, our chairman, convinced the board that a miracle in May Sunday, three months from this day, they would take an offering. And he said to the church, I know we're going to get enough money to build that building. Deep down inside, I thought, oh, Gary, is your faith going to be hurt when it doesn't take place? Well, on that May day, we were going to take an offering and 
And we explained the plan to everybody in the three months leading up to that miracle in May. I had my doubts. But I prayed along with the board every Sunday. And I, I often thought we should reconsider the size of this building. But they stood firm. The day of the offering came. The offering was taken. The board had so much confidence that they had in their planning, had plans drawn up, construction costs already figured out. They even had a construction firm that was ready to launch the project. And I'm thinking, how in the world are we going to be able to disappoint all these people? The offering was taken. The finance committee went back to count the money. And a little bit later, Gary walked out. Our chairman looked out, and he looked at me, and he made the announcement to the church. And he said this, not only did we hit the planned target, but there was so much in excess that we're going to be able to furnish the building as well. Can God accomplish the impossible? Yes. Yes, he can. I found out later that people had had yard sales. They sold whatever they could, believing. My wife did much the same. She made a commitment that shocked me a little bit. But I was ashamed at that point at my lack of faith. Well, five new church plants later, I had confidence. And the last church and that one, I knew it was going to happen. And it did, because God accomplishes the impossible. You know, 10 months later in that first church, we dedicated a gym-sized building that I thought was impossible. And in the years to follow, we filled that building twice. God accomplishes the impossible. Jesus called for bread and fish and, he, and to be brought to him and he gave thanks and for the meal. He broke the bread and then he did something really unique. He called the disciples up and he gave them pieces of bread and said, you go now and feed the crowd. That's what Jesus does with us, doesn't he? He says, you will accomplish with my help the impossible. Each disciple took a little bit and began to pass it out. But in the end, amazingly, the entire multitude was fed with that small offering. You know, Jesus provided as much as everybody wanted. It says in John 6, 11, they ate, they all ate and were satisfied. It says in Matthew 14, 20, Christ did not just meet the need, he had given them so much food that there were 12 baskets full of broken pieces. How many baskets were full? Twelve. Think about that. Little is much when God is in it. Claim that promise. Little is much when God is in it. Now, the Gospels of Mark and Luke tell a similar story involving a widow's gift. And I'm going to do something here. A long time ago, I purchased a couple of mites. And I'll tell you about it here in a second. I'll pass it around so everybody has a chance to take a look at what a mite is, a widow's mite. In Mark, there's the story of the widow's mite. One day, Jesus was sitting with his disciples near the temple treasury watching people deposit money in the offering receptacles that were there. The court of women that, that was outside of the temple held 13 such receptacles so people could put their money in. You know, Jesus watched as the rich were contributing large sums of money, but then came a widow, and she had two small coins in her hands. Two small copper coins which make up less than a penny in value. You know, the King James Version calls those coins mites. So we have coined the term the widow's mites. Well, the widow put her coins in the box. And Jesus called his disciples to him. And he pointed out her. You know, he wasn't going to criticize her for only putting in two small 
coins. He wanted his disciples to see something powerful that had taken place. Here's what he said. Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. You know, there are several things to notice about this story that teaches us. You know, first, God sees what man overlooks. The big gifts in the temple were surely noticed by people. That's probably what the disciples were watching. But Jesus saw that no one else noticed what the widow had put in. They sort of ignored her. He saw the humble gift of that poor widow. That was the gift that Jesus thought worthy of comment. You know, that was the gift the disciples needed to be aware of. The, others, the other gifts in the treasury that day made a lot of noise when they jingled in those receptacles. But the widow's mites were heard in heaven. Second, God's way of looking at things is different than man's way. The widow's two mites added up to a little less than a penny according to man's tabulation. But Jesus said she had given more that day than anyone else. How could this be when many rich people threw in large amounts, it says in Mark 12, 41? The difference is one of proportion. The rich were giving large sums, but they retained their fortunes. This widow put everything in that she had to live on that week. That's true sacrifice. You know, third, God commends giving in faith. Here was a woman in need of receiving charity, and yet she had the heart to give to God that day. Even though the amount was negligible, only a widow's might could buy what only a widow's might could buy. She gave in faith that God would use it. The widow's faith is evident in the fact that he gave her or that he noticed, Jesus noticed her giving. Like the widow who gave her last meal to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, the widow in the temple gave away her last means of self-support. Does that mean that the widow left the temple completely destitute, went home, and died of salvation, or starvation? I don't believe that at all. I believe it's much like the story of Elijah. In 1 Kings 17, 15, and 16, it says, She went away and did as Elijah told her. She gave everything. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the women and for her family, for the jar of flour that was used up and the jug of oil that did not run dry in keeping with the word of God was filled that day. I'm sure God also provided for the widow in Jesus' day as well. It's interesting that just before Jesus commented on the widow's might, he commented on the Pharisees and the scribes. He said to them, you devour widows' houses in Mark 12, 40. The religious officials of the day, instead of helping the widows in need, were perfectly con content to rob them of their livelihood and inheritance. The system was corrupt, and the darkness of the scribes' greed made the widow's sacrifice shine even more brightly, didn't it? God loves a cheerful giver, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and he's faithful to take care of his own. You know, God acts in many different ways. I spent 35 years starting new churches in New Mexico, Texas, and in Colorado. And I finally got tired of doing that because it's a lot of work to start a church. You know, first you have to move into a community. Then you have to find people to begin worshiping. You start with a Bible study in your home. And then the Bible study grows. Then you have to find a building to be able to meet in. And usually you have to haul chairs and musical instruments in. We, we had a trailer that we kept for years 
for every new church start. We had chairs in that trailer, musical instruments in that trailer, a sound system in that trailer. But every time we moved to a different place, we had to unload it. After six, six times doing that, I got tired. And I told Pat, I said, I'm going to apply for an established church. And I sent a resume to South Dakota. Pat said, South Dakota, what are you thinking? <laughs> and I said, honey, I don't want to start another church. I want to take an established church. And we moved to South Dakota. And what I didn't tell anybody is after six years of starting new churches, when we got to South Dakota, we didn't have a penny to our name. The church had provided a place for us to stay, and we moved in. And as, we, as we're moving in, people began bringing boxes of food into the house. They gave us a food party. Little did they know, we wouldn't have been able to eat unless they did something like that. God provides miracle after miracle after miracle. When Christians are willing to offer their lives sacrificially, letting go, letting go hold of their hold of whatever else, God will act in their lives. You know, Christians must never believe that they have too little to serve God with. God delights in taking the humble, seemingly insignificant person and using him for his or her glory. In feeding of the 5,000, Philip's mind immediately ran to the cost of the project. He quickly calculated in his brain how many man hours of work it was going to take to feed the 15 to 20,000 people. And, it's, and later on it says, you know, as he said it, it's going to take more than six months worth of wages to give everybody a little bit. Sometimes we do that too, don't we? What's it going to cost? What's it going to cost me? You know, it's something to note that Jesus fed the people through the disciples passing the food with such a small offering to teach them a lesson. You know, he could have snapped his fingers and caused the food just to be there if he chose. But instead, he gave, it to the, he gave little bits to the disciples to distribute to the people so that they could experience a what? A miracle. You know, in that way, the disciples had to trust the Lord for everything they distributed. They could only give as what they had received from Jesus. And as they began to pass that along, can you imagine what was going through their thoughts? When is it going to end? When am I going to run out? You know, when is it going to happen that I'm going to have to tell somebody I don't have enough? When, is, when are these little bits going to run out so I can't give the children? You know, who's going to have to sacrifice? You know, Christians should always be reminded that their problems are never too large for God to handle. Surely Andrew was wondering, what good are we going to do with five loaves and two fish? You know, believers know that God can multiply whatever he wants to feed as many people as he wants. But the problem comes in when we are faced with the practical working of that theory. I don't know how many times I've, I've proposed a solution to a problem only to hear, we can't afford it, or we're not ready at this time. Look around. How many seats do we have open? You know, it's not going to be any time at all until we're going to have to expand this building. Amen. And guess what somebody's going to say? Amen. We can't afford it. We're just too small 
or we're not going to be able to do it. I don't want to move anywhere else. I want to expand what we have because this is a great location, isn't it? You know, I want to see that take place. But watch out. Don't say we can't afford it. Don't say it's not time. When I came two years ago this Easter, our first week here, I knew this church would grow because God has his hand. I fell in love with the people here, friendly, open, welcoming, accepting. And I knew, I knew, not because of me, but because of you, the church would grow. And it's going to continue. I guarantee you. I know it will. I rally at looking at the young people we have at church now. You know, I'm going to tell a story that Pat's told a couple people so far. But um, she came in and, and uh, Eileen said, read the bulletin. And at the bottom of the bulletin, there's a, a statement down there that says, every Sunday we have a nursery. We didn't. Pat said, oh, no, we've got to get the nursery up. And I said, I think we have time, Pat. She said, no. It says in here we have a nursery. We're going to have a nursery. So Pat and I got the nursery ready with stuff that people gave. Really neat. Well, Pat's working with a ministry that's, that is in the school here in just four blocks down the road. And she had, I think, seven kids this week, or nine kids, and uh, a lady came in and had listened to the lesson that Pat taught the children that day. And the lady said, I'm going to a church, and we're not really happy with that church. She said, do you have a card? Where is your church? And Pat said, yeah, I have a card. And she gave her the card, and the lady said, is it okay if I bring my newborn? Does God speak to us. Pat calls it a God call. A God message. You know, there are similar stories throughout the scripture. You know, we're going to face some challenges, it's true, in this new year. The way we face those challenges is the way we're going to shape the future of Cactus Christian Fellowship. It's going to live way beyond me. But what we do now will shape the future of what happens at Cactus Christian Fellowship. I love seeing the young people up here playing and leading music. I enjoy watching Matthew bounce up and down playing the piano. Uh, to me, that is exciting. To me, that shows something that we do have a future. You know, so, it, so it expect the impossible to be possible as we put our trust in God's will. You know, we always need to remember the story of Abraham and Sarah. God told Abraham when he was 100 years old and his wife was 90, next year, your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to the conversation from the tent Abraham and Sarah were both old by this time, and Sarah was long past age of having children, it says in the scriptures. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such a pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is way old? <laughs> then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Amen. I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. In a year's time, Isaac was born. You know what Isaac the name Isaac means in the Hebrew? Laughter. Laughter. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? 
No, there isn't. Are we going to be able to accomplish what we need to accomplish here? Yes, we will. You know, God will make a difference. We're celebrating today, you know, the people that have, have started attending church in the last year or the last year and a half. And I look at, you know, Suzanne and Cecil. In my ministry, they were the very first people that came forward here to become part of this membership. They will always be special in my heart. Just the same as John and Bonnie came forward just a couple weeks ago. They will always be special in my heart. As I look out in the audience and I see all the new faces, you will always be special in my heart. So today, Pat and I were are hosting this, sort of, to celebrate the last two years and the growth we see here. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Even to move my faith. It might take a little bit. I think I, I, even though I was born in New Mexico, my mom used to say, you should have been from Missouri. <laughs> because my parents followed all the church starts that we had. And every time we would move to start a new church, I would say to my mom, my dad wasn't a Christian when I first started all this. My father became a Christian watching me and became the greatest supporter of our new church starts. He actually would supply my living income for the time we would start a church each time. And as I would go and, and talk to my parents each time we were going to start a new church, I would say to my mom, I think this time it's going to be impossible. Mom, I think this time they've sent me to a place where we're not going to be able to start a church. Whether it was Pagosa Springs, Colorado, or El Paso, Texas, or Las Cruces, New Mexico, each time I said, gosh, Mom, I don't be, don't be worried if I don't get this one going. And each time that we would have a dedication for a new building, my mom would come and she would say, is anything too hard for God? Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this time we can gather. Father, I pray for the, the blessing of this meal afterwards, Father. That, Father, as we look around and share a meal together, we can see the new faces. And we can see those that have been the standard bearers here. That, Father, knew it wasn't too hard for you. Knew that with you, nothing was impossible. Father, I claim that promise now as we face this new year. Father, as we face what lies ahead for us, the glory of knowing nothing is impossible. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name.